And we are, as a people, inherently and historically Wake up. opposed to secret societies, the se secret oaths, and, ask a and the secret proceedings. The show that asks questions about why we don't ask questions. What the hell is going on? This is Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. to Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. These are the Conspiracy Queries, and I am Alan Park. Thanks for tuning us in again. Do we still get to say that? Tuning in? Does it even... Is that a thing? Today we have a show for you that is going to, uh, hopefully, as always, peel back the layers of um, fiction. Our guest today, we do have one. It's Mark Taliano. He is a retired high school teacher, so kudos for him just for that. I don't know how he survived that, what must have felt like a military uh, tour. It's tough in there sometimes. Mark, is a uh, he's an activist, and he's a citizen journalist. You'll see uh, uh, works of his written on CommonDreams.org. He's also contributed to the Huffington Post, some more mainstream publications. And Mark is... Um, has always been suspect of what is going on and what has been going on in Syria. And so he's going over there. He is uh, going to be telling us about what he knows now and what he, uh, who he expects to uh, speak with when he's there, and we'll have a chat with him when he returns. So that's a little later on the show. Mark Taliano will be here. And uh, just to get things going, and specifically for the new listener or the skeptical listener, or maybe you're both, Either way, thanks for listening. I want to talk a little bit about false flag terror, false flag operations, because it's a huge topic and we don't really cover it much. It's kind of important to know about it for the interview with Mark Taliano. What he's saying is that what's going on in Syria is not how it is being presented to us in our beloved mainstream uh, CNN, Fox, CBC BBC Western World Journalism, and that uh, the only way they can put things of that nature that are not true out there is uh, is by use of understanding the false flag concept, false flag terror, and using it to one's own advantage. So, uh, for example, it wasn't really what was going on in Vietnam when, when they called uh, for an attack into Vietnam that was triggered by what was referred to back then as the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Tonkin. Uh, I'd say Tonkin, but, you know, I'm a Western person. Tonkin was the uh, actual pronunciation. The USS Maddox was a ship that was supposedly put under attack by uh, North Vietnamese motor torpedo boats. I'm not going to spend really any time at all on the Gulf of Tonkin incident, other than to say it is a false flag, it was indeed a false flag. It'd be pretty smart to figure that there were false flags before that and have been false flags since that. But here's a great piece I'd like to buzz through quickly that was posted on September 12th on Washington's blog.com. Presidents, prime ministers, congressmen, generals, spooks, that's spies, soldiers, and police admit to false flag terror. In the following instances, officials in the government which carried out the attack or seriously proposed an attack admit to it, either orally, in writing, or through photographs or videos. Now, let's stop right here. You might be a person that doesn't believe any of this, and I'm sure there are loads of folks like that out there. This is where you need to just crack open your mind a little bit. This this is, again, presidents, prime ministers, congressmen, generals, spies, soldiers, and police admitting to it, not a, a radio show on the Internet making it up. Number one, in 1697, Native American conspirators admitted in court that Iroquois leaders convinced a Piscataway tribesman to murder an English woman in Virginia for the purpose of igniting a war between the English and the Piscataway, thus weakening both parties and allowing the Iroquois to seize Piscataway lands. Now, this won't be a deep, deep history lesson. Uh, we're going back to 1697 there, but it is a tactic. It has been a tactic. It's often used. And uh, 
has been rolling on through. I'm sure it goes well before 1697. Maybe we can do an ancient history show sometime. Here's another quick one. Japanese troops set off a small explosion on a train track in 1931 and falsely blamed it on China in order to justify an invasion of Manchuria. This is known as the Mukden incident or the Manchurian incident. The Tokyo military tribunal, the International Military Tribunal, found, quote, several of the participators in the plan, including Hashimoto, that was a high-ranking Japanese army officer, have on various occasions admitted their part in the plot and have stated that the object of the incident was to afford an excuse for the occupation of Manchuria by the Kwantung Army. And there are more examples of this. Uh, A major Nazi SS kind of dude, you know, one of those sick buggers. He admitted at the Nuremberg trial that under orders from the chief of the Gestapo, he and some other Nazi operatives faked attacks on their own people and resources, which they blamed on the Poles to justify the invasion of Poland. Okay, one more. Number four, the minutes of the high command of the Italian government subsequently approved by Mussolini himself admitted that violence on the Greek-Albanian border was carried out by Italians and falsely blamed on the Greeks as an excuse for Italy's 1940 invasion of Greece. These examples go on and on throughout history. And I know a lot of people have trouble believing that a government wouldn't do that to its own people. My goodness! Wow. Talk about tinfoil hats. Um, Maybe they work in reverse sometimes to keep information out. Yeah, so there there are there have been plenty of uh Russian false flag attacks, uh, British false flag attacks, bombed five ships carrying Jews attempting to flee the Holocaust and seek safety in Palestine, and they set up a fake group called Defenders of Arab Palestine and then had that pseudo group falsely claim responsibility for the bombings and it goes on and on. Israel has done the same thing. They admitted in 1954 In 1954, I doubt they admitted it then, an Israeli terrorist cell operating in Egypt planted bombs in several buildings, including U.S. diplomatic facilities, and then left behind evidence implicating the Arabs as the culprit. One of the bombs detonated prematurely, allowing the Egyptians to identify the bombers, and several of the Israelis later confessed. This goes on all the time. So I'm saying things that are are in fact uh, verifiable and true, as will our guest today, So you're going to hear all about what he has to say. It is somewhat different than what is presented in the mainstream. So that is, uh, once again, that's from WashingtonBlogs.com. Great article. Check it out. False Flag is uh, briefly stated a horrific staged event blamed on a political enemy and used as a pretext to start a war or enact draconian laws in the name of national security. That's what it is. And that's what they are. It's okay, though. It didn't work out too badly for Saudi Arabia and America. Despite uh, that particular incident, they've become very, very friendly lately. And um, we will get into that as well with our interview. Just like to throw in uh, this more recent article as well. This is on IntelliHub. ISIS's. If it says ISIS with an apostrophe after it, did you just say ISIS? Or do you say ISIS is? It's very difficult. These people obviously didn't think this thing out in more than just one way. ISIS's new top military commander was trained in the U.S. by Blackwater and the State Department. Washington considers Kalimov a particular threat due to his counterterrorism training that they once again uh, provided to him on their soil. In Mosul, Iraq, former Tajikistan Special Forces Colonel Gulmurad Kalimov defected to the ranks of ISIS last year and publicly declared jihad against the West. After being trained in the United States by private military contractor Blackwater, who I think they've changed their name now. I think they've they've uh, every year they go through some kind of identity shakeup, uh, presumably to avoid persecution on any front, or they just like making up different names. Kalimov has reportedly been promoted from within the Islamic State organization and has been named the new chief military commander for the global terror group. 
There's information in the Islamic State that Tajik Gulmarad Kalimov was named new chief military commander of ISIS after the murder of the previous leader, and that was a good day, Abu Omar al-Shishani. A source in Nineveh province, where ISIS stronghold of Mosul is located, told Iraqi al Sumaria. So, uh, yeah, they've got a they've got a guy in there who was trained in the states, and of course, the nine eleven attackers were trained in the states, and it goes on like this. Um, but anyway, Mark will be here in just a couple of minutes to bring that out. I just wanted to mention before we go, uh, we're not being hosted by the radio station anymore. So thanks for following us while we were there. And uh, we, we've found a new way to kind of make things go, and that is with uh, Patreon, patreon.com. It would be so wonderful if you would go over to patreon.com slash conspiracy queries and check it out. You can you can pledge certain amounts there, and you don't have to do it uh, once. You don't have to do it twice. You don't have to do it at all. But we would like it if you are listening to the show to consider posting uh, $2, $5, a one-time, a, a monthly. There are various rewards there for you. If you pledge certain amounts of money, we will give you a shout-out. $2 will give you a shout-out. $5 will answer your favorite conspiracy question and air it on the podcast. And the uh, the favors get sweeter and, and more fun uh, the higher the amount goes. So that's patreon.com slash conspiracy queries. And now, let's go to our interview. <laughs> Why don't we start off with uh, telling everybody exactly, you know, who you are, what you're, what you do, and why you are going to Syria. I'm a uh, former high school teacher, and I retired early, and I've had uh, time to do what I've always done, except I've had more time, which is to do uh, research work. I've been researching and trying to decode propaganda, which is pervasive in North America has de degenerated to the point where the news is based news stories are basically uh, propaganda stories that serve the interests of, of the war machine in particular and they do not the news does not serve the interests of the public and in fact it conceals from the public the reality of what the uh, deep state is doing in the military complex is doing. Okay, before we get to Syria, can, can I just jump in and ask you, what would be okay. something that, that signals you that says, hey, this is not as it seems to be? I mean, it's, uh, you've got me on side, but how do you convince someone else that the, the news is propaganda? First of all, I don't watch MSM anymore. I don't watch mainstream media anymore. It fails to explain to the audience, for example, that Syria is a sovereign state, a sovereign country, it has a duty to protect its sovereignty and its territorial integrity, as does every nation. It, Canada, for example, the Canadian defense minister said, Assad, he really does have to go. He must go. In other words, he's telling that the U.S. line and the NATO line, which is an endorsement for illegal regime change. It's entirely illegal, according to Nuremberg principles. It's a war against peace. It's a war of aggression. The last time I saw mainstream media, they weren't stressing that, and that should be stressed. Uh, the United Nations purpose is peace, not to cover the crimes of the U.S. empire. And it tries for peace, but it's not successful. And the fact that our governments are not telling us the truth intentionally. I don't. I think even most of our politicians don't know what the truth is. That means that they're necessarily ruling, governing us without our consent. They don't have our consent to do this. How many Canadians would consent to committing war crimes or to our government committing war crimes? When, when we were bombing Syria, those were war crimes. And that happened during the Harper regime. Now we're fueling the planes that are illegally bombing Syria. Now we are part of, a, of illegal sanctions against Syria. Those sanctions kill people, There's particularly young people, infants who don't have access to medicine that they should have. 
And therefore, that's an arm of the war machine, and we are engaging in that. How much of that would you say has to do with the media? I mean, when Harper was uh, the prime minister and carrying those missions out, uh, people were were praising him uh, uh, for other um, conservative issues that he was tackling, uh, although they didn't. Uh, a lot of people didn't like Harper. And then when now we have a Justin Trudeau in, and, and, and a lot of people like him for different reasons, but he's also carrying out the same military missions uh, against uh, Syria and also propping up the Saudi uh, armament. Justin Trudeau is very, very charismatic, I understand. And he's very popular, and he promised to legalize marijuana, projects a very progressive front, which arguably makes him more dangerous than Harper. Because, as you said, the same agenda is being pushed through. Now, our current government, whose prime minister is Justin Trudeau, signed a contract with Wahhabi Saudi Arabia, the chief financial of the terrorists trying to destroy Syria. Each of these companies has a pre-designated role. Saudi Arabia is used to finance. They're working for the United States and NATO. They, they have a lot of oil money, and they're financing a lot of these mercenary terrorists. That way, the United States has possible deniability. They can deny that their hands are dirty, but in terms of financing, and they can hide that from Congress. They don't have a declaration of war by Congress either. So, I mean, it's totally illegal for the United States to be flying in Syrian airspace pretending to attack ISIS, which they're actually protecting ISIS and all the terrorists. So the Saudis are financing these terrorists. When the United States and NATO destroyed Libya, as they did, with the false pretext of responsibility to protect, which was which originated, I believe, at the Monk Monk School in Toronto. I think I can't remember what it's called, Monk School of Globalization Studies or something like that. Right, the Robert Monk Center. Yeah. Okay, so they use that, even though it contradicts the internet. Anyway, they use that to destroy Syria, including Syria's water infrastructure. They bomb infrastructure, and part of the reason that Libya was destroyed, part of the reason. Part of it was to stop the uh, gold diner, the competing currencies, and to rob the bank, and to rob the petrol, and to loot and plunder. The part of, that's what imperialism is all about, power, looting, plunder. Part of the reason was to access the armories and to get the weapons that Gaddafi had so that they could ship them as they did successfully, the CIA orchestra was behind this and running it as per usual. And they ran these weapons from Libya to terrorists with the purpose of using them in Syria, which is exactly what happened. Right now, terrorists, and this is all illegal, but this is fully documented also. If you look at my article, I have full documentation of this. I have like primary source information. If yeah, well, look at my article. Yeah, Defense Intelligence Agency. This, I all I have Western sources to substantiate all of this. Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, General Wesley Clark's acknowledged that this was a plan to topple these governments. It's all pre pre planned. Okay, it goes back as far as probably 2006, maybe earlier. It's all documented with Western sources. The plan is and was to use proxy mercenaries, and I think they're from maybe 60 to 80 countries, to go in there and destroy the country. So we, the West, are supporting this. When Canada sanctions Syria, that serves to weaken Syria and to weaken the population and to make the population stressed so that they have little place, they have little money, and, you know, they don't have health care, they can't take care of their families, and they're hoping that the government 
the population will reject its government. So the Syrian people right now, because they're experiencing these uh, illegal uh, incursions and, and invasions and manipulation of their sovereign political system, are scrambling all over the place, supposedly creating this refugee crisis. And once again, Justin Trudeau has been um, one of the leaders of the world who has been uh, supposedly more magnanimous in bringing people from Syria into the country. It creates a, a completely different political firestorm. While people, uh, general public members think, a lot of them think, uh, particularly the conservative ones think, you know, we're, we're inviting these people from a terrorist nation into our country. This Justin Trudeau is an awful person for doing this. What do you make of that twisted pretzel? Well, Justin Trudeau and his government create the refugees and work with the terrorists. We are the chief sponsors of terrorism. We, the West. Oh, that's the part that's not in the news. Okay, gotcha. Okay, we are ISIS. We are the terrorists. We created this war, okay? Therefore, we created the refugees. Syria wants these people back. Syria needs these people to rebuild its country. It doesn't like losing people. But people, when a bunch of terrorist head choppers come into town and start literally taking off your heads and shooting people and bombing and committing atrocities, uh, people have to move. And most of them move. If they don't leave the country, they leave the government-protected areas. They certainly do not go to terrorist invaded areas where they don't even have voting. Now, the problem with this plan, a lot of problems, if we put the criminality aside, which we can't do this, but just for the sake of this discussion, we'll put the criminality and the morality aside. The problem is Syrians love their government. Syrians love President al-Assad. You don't hear much of that on uh, the Western. You don't hear, they love him. Oh, they voted for him overwhelmingly. Now, this peace conference, people from the West who go over there, and I'm going over there, they say support for him is rampant, okay? He has been, the Syria has been withstanding an assault from maybe 60 countries, all of NATO, West Canada, for almost six years. How many countries could ever do that without being toppled? This is a fatal flaw of the West. They didn't. They did not understand that Syrians could hold off this much. And I can't imagine any other country being able to do that. And Syria's allies are strong. Those include Russia, Iran, Hezbollah, some Palestinian battalions. And and Russia, of course, um, is very strong ally. China. China, yeah. Yeah. And so Russia, for example, I mean... The Western case is built on lies, and I have an article on this, too. I have articles on all of this. You think you might have seen uh, some kind of preparation for the, the losing uh, military effort in Syria after spending so much time losing in Afghanistan. They've, they've also managed to hold off people. Um, they had a 10-year Soviet invasion through the 80s, and, uh, and now, once again, we've uh, sunk you know, millions of dollars into that effort and, and certainly don't control that country. Well, and it's interesting you should mention that because uh, the West supported the same type of terrorists there, the Mujahideen, and and they did it in Chechnya too. These un-Islamic, so-called Islamic terrorists are born and bred in Saudi Arabia. They're supported by us, our allies, Saudi Arabia. They are groomed in Wahhabi schools. They have a whole feeder system, and the in Syria now, the occupied areas, which are getting smaller all the time, thank God, they send kids to these schools to turn them into these extremist mercenaries, okay? Uh, a lot of the suicide, most of the suicide bombers are from uh, Saudi Arabia. Who also cut off far more heads, apparently, than, than does ISIS. Oh, Saudi is horrible. It's just a horrible dictatorship. It, that country shouldn't even exist. I mean, it's not really a country. It's run by one family. There are our allies, though, and we have this huge military contract with Saudi Arabia. Aren't we great? That should never have gone through, and that went through with Trudeau. Well, I think that's important that people do understand that, because everything that you mentioned about what has been said about Syria, and so why we in Canada and the West are supposedly uh, fixing things by going into their business, uh, mm. more certainly applies 
to Saudi Arabia. If there's a country we should be bombing or, or removing the dictators who chop off the heads of, of uh, innocent people and human rights abuse, we should be, by those, those same metrics, invading Saudi Arabia. Never happens. Don't- Yes, those metrics are how they sell these wars. They're, those metrics are all lies, as you just indicated. They said, oh, we're going to free women by invading Afghanistan. That was a, that was oh, a yeah. report. That had nothing to do with freeing women. They were supporting al-Qaeda and, and, and so on. Now, what is victory for this, these degenerate Western foreign policy people? Well, if you destroy a country, which they destroyed Libya, in their minds, that's a victory because they got to loot and plunder and steal their weapons and prevent the gold dinar from flourishing. I mean, Afghanistan before intervention, I think in the 50s or whatever, like women had high, it was a civilized place. Women went to university and so on. Yeah, that's some great old footage. Yeah, I mean, they destroyed Afghanistan, but they have control and military installations like pipeline routes. Okay, so to them, that's. To this psychopath, that's the victory, but it's not working in Syria, thank goodness. Now, why because, is that? How, how is it? They're so dug well, in there. They know what's going on. They must obviously have a better take on things uh, uh, than we do in Canada from our news. Syria? Yeah. Well, well, they know what's going on. For example, Russia exposed the lie about the, the bombing mission. When the U.S. NATO were illegally bombing, and I thought, oh, this is documented, ISIS territory expanded. Well, obviously, they weren't bombing ISIS. They were bombing infrastructure, destroying the country. They were pretending to bomb. Maybe they were controlling ISIS in areas. So a lot of these different groups, they sometimes have conflicting interests. They maybe they sometimes attack each other. They want loot and plunder and so on and so forth. But they have the same goal. They... They want to destroy the secular state of Bashar al-Assad's government, the hugely popular government. But when Russia came in and started bombing, all of a sudden the terrorists were being wiped out. It didn't take long for the terrorists to be wiped out. When you're legitimately trying to attack When you're legitimately trying to bomb them. Yeah. And that's what Russia did, and they almost cleared them out in in very little period of time. That exposed the lie of the West. Now, you can think, well, maybe the Western pilots are really, really bad and their airplanes are really, really bad and they just couldn't do the job. Well, sorry, I don't buy that. Does the timeline with uh, Russia's attacks on Syria smoothing out the problem and getting rid of the the actual uh, terrorist, as you say, does that timeline um, converge with the timeline of how relatively recently we've been told what a terrible place Russia is again, and what a terrible man Putin is again. Uh, Probably. That's another thing. I mean, and this gets back to our current government. A NATO chief, a top-level NATO source, I wrote an article on this too, said publicly that um, Russia is not a threat. Okay, so we are the threat. NATO is expanding. Russia isn't, okay? Um, Russia is not the bad guy. Russia does not have base, military bases all over the world. The U.S. does. Right. And it's a real shame that the uh, West has to create these uh, demons, fabricate them, because they, otherwise they don't exist. Because now we have all of this, these terrorist organizations, these mercenary terrorists, and they're not nice. They're not doing nice things, as you know. And now we have this fabricated Russian threat. Interview interrupt. Okay, just want to stop Mark right there. This is from Facebook a couple of years ago. A fellow named Majd, M-A-J-D, wrote these words on a Facebook posting. Quote, I am Syrian living in Syria in the middle of everything. We have seen horrors. It was never a revolution nor a civil war. The terrorists are sent by your government. They are Al-Qaeda, Jabhat al-Nusra, Wahhabi Salafists, Talibans, etc., and the extremist jihadists sent by the West, and some of them that were trained in the States, the Saudis, Qatar, and Turkey. Your Obama and whoever is behind him, very astute, or above him, are supporting al-Qaeda and leading a proxy war on my country. 
We thought you are against Al-Qaeda, and now you support them. The majority here loves Assad. He has never committed a crime against his own people. Now, I realize that people are going to disagree with that, but I am just quoting this fellow on Facebook. The chemical attack was staged by the terrorists, helped by the USA and the UK, etc. Everyone knows that here. American soldiers and people should not be supporting barbarian Al-Qaeda terrorists who are killing Christians, Muslims in my country, and everyone. Every massacre is committed by them. We were all happy in Syria. We had free school and university education available for everyone. Sounds like Iraq. Free health care, no GMOs, no fluoride, no chemtrails, no Rothschild IMF-controlled bank, a state-owned central bank which gives 11% interest. We are self-sufficient and have no foreign debt to any country or bank. Oh, that's a good way to start a war. Life before the crisis was so beautiful here. Now it is hard and horrific in some regions. I do not understand how the good and brave American people can accept to bomb my country, which has never harmed them, and therefore help the barbarian Al-Qaeda. These animals slit throats and behead for pleasure. They behead babies and rape young kids. They are satanic. Our military, helped by the millions of civilian militias, are winning the battle against Al-Qaeda. But now the USA wants to bomb the shit out of us so that Al-Qaeda can get the upper hand. Please help us, American people. They are destroying the cradle of civilization. Stop your government. Impeach that bankster puppet you have as president. Support Ron Paul or Rand or anyone of the like who are true American patriots. But be sure of one thing. If they attack, and I think they will, it will be hell. Be sure that if it were to be a world war, many, many will die. Syria can and will defend itself and will sink many U.S. ships. Iran will go to war. Russia and China eventually, if it escalates. And all this for what? For the elites who created Al-Qaeda through the U.S. government and use it to conduct proxy wars and destabilize countries which do not go along with their new world order agenda. American people, you got to regain control of your once admirable country. Now everyone hates you for the death you bring almost everywhere. Ask the Iraqis, the Afghans, the Pakistanis, the Palestinians, the Syrians, the Macedonians and Serbs, the Libyans, the Somalis, the Yemenis, all the ones you kill with drones every day. Stop your wars. Enough wars. Use diplomacy, dialogue, help, not force. This seems to be a fairly consistent testimony from a Syrian. Now, there are many like that. I'm not saying... That's 100% straight up across the board, but that guy sure is. Uh, I could put out the other side of the story about how the Americans are helping us by going into Iraq and blah, 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 and helping us by going into Syria and blah, 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 but we get enough of that. This, is, this show is to help us see the other side of the coin. So with that in mind, let's go back to our interview. <laughs> And Russia also has a job to protect its army and territorial integrity. Well, it sounds like a really good time to uh, invest in military hardware and companies like McDonnell Douglas and those that supply the Pentagon with their weapons of choice. Because and if that, you keep on perpetuating this problem and you never get to a solved problem, uh, you're guaranteeing income. It's like having free energy. Can't do that because then what would happen to your monthly electricity bill? You're guaranteeing free income for certain segments of the population as the rest of the population is impoverished. But you're correct that certain, the military industrial complex profits, but it's very dangerous because now the deep state of which the military and CIA are part, they have a, a way too much power. They have these lobbies that are putting pressure as lobbies do on the government, there has become a process of normalization of the use of nuclear weapons in the sense that they have these so-called mini nukes, some of which are more powerful than Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that are being in a line between conventional and nuclear is now being blurred intentionally so that the likelihood of the use of nuclear weapons, which I think is happening already, in Africa, is, is a lot higher. 
This is like asymmetrical warfare, where in olden days we used to go to war against a particular country, and now it's more of a, an ideology, and you can't really contain the enemy in, in one place. So now you're saying the same thing is happening to the, the nuclear weapon distribution it, itself. Well, I mean, we are the enemy. We, we are the ones, I mean, wherever ISIS goes, we're right there, because then we can bomb under the pretext of bombing ISIS. Well, these bunker buster bombs, for example, that were ostensibly used to get Osama bin Laden. Sure. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> they they can be equipped with nuclear weapons. This, these so-called defensive weapons that are encroaching on uh, Russia, Putin knows and everyone knows they can be easily switched over to offensive weapons. So the West is breaking every rule of the book, and the mainstream media is not telling the people this. And the mainstream media, therefore, is genocidal and criminal. If this is Conspiracy Queries. We're listening to Mark Taliano. Mark is a researcher and uh, has discovered for himself that what comes across the mainstream news isn't anywhere near exactly what it is. And, and he's off to Syria on a bit of a fact-finding mission, and we'll speak with him when he gets back. Mark, uh, can you tell me a little bit more? You used the phrase deep state. Is that what yeah. you said? What, what is the deep state? Well, uh, that's uh, especially a Peter, Professor uh, Peter Dale Scott. But basically, uh, the deep state includes the power centers behind the politicians, uh, the, some of the power centers. And the argument now, which is very realistic, is that the deep state has way too much control. The deep state, uh, for example, includes what the CIA is doing underneath the radar that we don't know what they're doing. And I think a lot of these politicians probably most don't know what they're doing either. The argument is that they are, the uh, intelligence agencies are creating on their own foreign policy that does not benefit us. I mean, if we have nuclear war, that does not benefit us. If all of our tax dollars go to the uh, military industrial complex, that does not benefit us. We should be making fast trains and infrastructure and so on. I don't know what your thoughts are on... Um... On the political uh, situation, I don't want to spend too much time uh, on that now, on the mainstream situation. But just to raise a bit of a notion, you had a guy like Bernie Sanders who, who yes. may or may not be what he says he was. Let's just leave that aside for a moment. But he was yeah. campaigning on on the promise of uh, you know, income equality for people, etc. And, and this was portrayed – as a uh, as you know, a terrible socialist idea. How can we? How does this guy come up with all of the ideas that are? It's pie in the sky. Uh, there's no way you could bring that to the people anyway, even even if you wanted to. And they go on about the impossibility of it. And so many people that I've spoken with and, and have heard about and read about have no idea the amount of money that's designated officially on the official books, never mind the deep state or the shadow state yeah. books, that goes into propping up the military and making sure that they're always, <clears throat> they're best outfitted with the latest gear. If you took half of what is designated for the military, which and leaving them with half would still be too much in my books, but if you took yeah. half of that and spread it around uh, in the way that uh, a person like Sanders is trying to say, it would, compl it would be completely affordable. And, and you'd be spending money on the infrastructure at home and improving situations at home instead of claiming you're doing things to improve uh, the situation for Afghanistan women, etc. Does it frustrate it, you sometimes that you're trying to bring news that is deep state news? This is heavy news to people that really don't have any idea of, of what is possible if you allocate funds in the right place. Yes, of course, it's frustrating. The media doesn't talk about this. We used to borrow from the and we used to borrow from the Bank of Canada. <laughs> we didn't have to spend interest. Now, since since that was closed down, I think in '74, uh, we spent I think what over a trillion in interest payments for what for nothing. We could be borrowing from the Bank of Canada, that's our bank, and that makes a lot of sense. It would improve our economy. Uh, fully public health care, universal health care makes a lot of sense. It's less expensive. It makes us more competitive. It would make the United States more competitive if they had publicly funded health care, because then companies like GM and Ford, their benefit plans would be far less expensive because they wouldn't have to be paying to private services and private providers. And they could compete better with Japan, who has 
health care is covered. I see in the, in the oh. American hair, car companies, you, you want them to do something like that. And meanwhile, when they get into financial trouble through the banking system that put them there, um, they, they get a bailout from the public instead of uh, getting a benefit from it so the rest wins? of the time. The, the people with the loopholes win. The, the, the banksters win. I mean, but And yeah. who owns the media outlets, the mainstream media? Now, the, the good thing is, I think, People are slowly becoming aware that the main the window of the world as presented by the mainstream media isn't exactly the whole thing at all. It's a very small window with a very narrow focus. Some of the mainstream is losing some credibility, I would hope. But on the other hand, we have the state, including Canada, uh, suppressing information, suppressing the people with police state legislation, surveillance. And how did we get to that? More deep state activity. A lot of the people in the uh, United States, arguably in charge of or, or trying to make sure the election turns out a certain way. Basically, the two faces of the, the same party turns out the same way. But the stats are in and the television expenditures for advertising candidates, particularly the two presidential candidates right now, is, is less than half of what it was in 2012. So they're still getting to force their agenda through, and they don't even need to spend as much money on advertising because as long as you've got a few people locked up and and supposedly that's enough to rudder the ship, they're good with that. But how long is this going to last? I don't know because we now have repressive legislation like C-51, yeah, uh, which that Ottawa shooting triggers. And uh, people think that false flags are conspiracy theories even though they've been going on for decades in history, or even longer, any war started with false flag. And, and we just had a proven false flag, the pressure cooker bombers, the judge proved it was false flag, the terrorists were the government, the state agency. You bring up the notion of false flags. Um, this is never, dis- I don't remember learning about false flags in history in high school, and uh, it's something that I've come across on my own as an adult. I think everybody should know about them. Tell us about false flags, and if you can, put put a false flag together that has helped us uh, become lured into Syria or, or something as recent? Okay, the West needs pretext, phony excuses to invade. Well, there was this claim that the East Gouda poison gas attack was initiated by the government, the elected government of President Bashar al-Assad. Okay. Well, it was proven beyond any reasonable doubt that it was the terrorists. But if people can be led to believe that was a false flag operation, in other words, the terrorists gassed these people and made it look like the government did. So if the government can be vilified, then Western people can be led to believe that it's right to invade them. So it's a military tactic. It's ages old. I think every war started with a false flag. It just happens all the time. It happened in Vietnam all the time. So getting back to Syria. So if you can blame a massacre or a a gas attack on the government, even when you did it, that's a brilliant tactic. It worked. Now you get to invade. But, uh, well, fortunately, it was proven beyond any reasonable doubt that President Bashar al-Assad did not gas his own people. There would be no reason for him to do that. It would be outright stupidity especially since the U.N. delegation was to come in shortly thereafter. It was proven that uh, the uh, terrorists did it, okay? What the terrorists will often do, these mercenary terrorists, is they will commit atrocities and blame it on the government. False flag terrorism, the military tactic. Is this a similar, uh, is this what happened with uh, the big bad guy, Saddam Hussein, in Iraq with the with the Kurds and gassing the Kurds? I mean, I know there was a lot of talk then that the gas that he used, if he did use the gas, I don't know if he did, but that it was American-supplied chemical. Right. Like, he didn't have weapons of mass destruction, however you want to term that. I mean, we do, and we did. Uh, I don't know if he got, I think... Yeah, I think he used gas against uh, Kurds, uh, provided by us, of course, by the West. So he did uh, gas. He did gas well, the Kurds. Well, okay, I, I, I don't want to go there because I don't know enough about it. I don't know the context. Context is everything. Fair enough. I mean, I mean, gas attacks, they were happening in mustard gas in World War One. 
they're not that effective, really. I mean, if the wind blows, uh, there goes your gas attack. There's a lot of uh, hellfire missiles are pretty effective, really. Right. I mean, that's a bit of a distraction in and of itself. I mean, there's a lot more efficient ways of wiping out people. And, and uh, for example, the Western sanctions before the invade, illegal invasion of Iraq uh, killed about almost 600,000 kids under beneath, you know, five and under range. Okay. Wow. And about a million or so others. I mean, that's pretty disgusting. And, and it was admitted publicly Madeleine Albright said, we think it was worth it. Uh, so, I mean, this is, these are the crimes that are perpetrated that aren't splashed on the front page of the news and, and war. Unfortunately there are, well, innocent people get killed. That's why we try to avoid war. And that's why we try to obey international law, which the West right now does not like to do. So Mark, you, uh, you've seen the, the lies and the manipulation here, and now you are uh, getting ready to go to Syria. And what do you expect yes. to do when you go there? I expect to meet Syrians, and some of whom I, you know, through the internet I know some people already. I expect to meet some religious figures. Uh, Ken Stone from Hamilton, he's a peace activist, he was there recently, and he suggested that we look at the... Um, try to put a focus on, on uh, women, which I think is a good idea because. Is that a female dog barking in the background? Two female bull masters, yeah. <laughs> He's not talking about you, <laughs> ladies. Yeah. It's a very secular society and women have uh, equal rights, but if, if uh, the terrorists succeed, then they're going to get Sharia law and uh, burqas and all sorts of repression. So right now, Syrians are fighting for their country and for their life because they know if they lose, they're going to get, they're going to be like Libya or Iraq or Afghanistan, countries that are destroyed by the West. All of these imperial invasions are extraordinarily misogynist because the women suffer horribly. And and so we want to, if possible, get a focus on what's going to happen. To, what? How do women feel about this? I under, now, for example, I understand there are women brigades, okay? There are uh, women soldiers fighting for their country. So, and some women are, are in very high positions of a government. I think one, a woman is a, a, a prime minister, and a, there's this spokesperson, and I, I can't pronounce her name correctly, but a very eloquent uh, spokesperson who is a woman. So right now, women, uh, there's a great deal of equality, in my understanding. Is there's a great deal of equality in Syria between men and women, and, and their uh chances to advance in society but if it god forbid they lose this war which i, I think they're going to win but they are winning that that would all change drastically and it would be a horrible thing so if, if when i go there uh, i would like to put a bit of a focus on that as well as we'll be meeting political leaders elected leaders and so on and the people themselves who are in government protected areas are you with? Are you going over there with other people? And uh, and if so, what do you call yourself? And do you expect to have any trouble returning to Canada when they're saying this guy's coming back from Syria? What's going on? It's an international peace tour uh, based in Australia, uh, so there will uh, I will be from Canada. There may be another one from Canada. I don't know exactly. I know one. Uh, I don't know exactly the makeup, but it's from people around the world, including Australia. I hope there will be no issues nothing that i'm doing is illegal to my knowledge at this time <laughs> that hasn't stopped them before <laughs> i'm going in legally i'm getting syrian government approval to go in unlike some people who go in through turkey illegally including all the terrorists they're tons of terrorists so everything i'm doing supposedly is legal and to my knowledge is legal so i hope to not experience any problems. Well, just because uh, it's legal doesn't mean it's always going to keep you out of trouble, as you must know. Yes. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm hopeful in the table that I'm at is wood, so I'm touching a lot of wood. But um, it's a peace mission. And I would like to think that all of us are striving for peace rather than war. Peace and prosperity. And how long you, are you going to be there, Mark? Roughly a week. One yeah. week. Okay. And then, and then I'm hoping to put together a book. I already have lots of articles, which will form the basis of the book, but I'll write some more. I'm hoping to put together a book with uh, global research. Oh, that's fantastic. Michelle Chazadowski. Yeah. Yes. And um, 
I will be promoting that and I will be promoting that with Ken Stone as well. He has a little book, he has a book out based upon his experiences in, um, in Syria. Ken Stone, he's from Hamilton, Ontario? Yes, a longtime peace activist. Right, good. That's the same one I was thinking of then. Well, Mark, yep. if there's anything else you'd like to, to, to put in here, I'm, I'm all ears. No, that's great. I, I enjoy the opportunity to talk. Uh, and it's very timely because the anniversary of 9-11. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> and that that uh, we're starting to get more transparency there, and I hope more public acceptance for what's really going on. Because those of us looking for the truth behind nine eleven are seeking peace. We are the peace. We're seeking for peace. Well, I heard you're all nuts. Apparently not. <laughs> yeah, I got to share this with you, Mark, because well, I, some I, people. Yes. I've been reading your posts on Facebook for a while, and we have some mutual uh, Facebook friends. That's how I first came across you. And the things that you post and talk about, right on the money with a lot of these things, you won't find any of this stuff on the 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock news. Um, it's no. amazing what gets buried. And people yes. people think that researchers like yourself are crazy because the things yeah. that you're finding out are abhorrent and disgusting, and we're actually paying for it. It's disgusting. I find it so frustrating that you're saying that the light is starting to shine through on 9-11. Yeah, but it's been 15 years, man. Yeah, it's too long. It's too long. It's ridiculous. Uh, yeah, it's too long. I mean, you know, the, you, you didn't find out about the Kennedy assassination in the House investigations until 78. I mean, that's when they finally said, yeah, it was a conspiracy. 16 years after the fact, 16 years after they buried the truth in a fictitious report called the Warren Commission, yeah. just like the 9-11 report was a fictitious report. They didn't even want to start that one, but yeah. it's all bullshit. Well, that's deep state. And I am tired of waiting 15 years, 20 years. Yeah, it's too long. It's too long. We're waiting too long. And and Professor Anthony Hall, I mean, it, it sounds outlandish, okay? So I have a lot of respect for Noam Chomsky, um, as do a lot of people, but he's covering for 9-11. Why is that? Is he a disinformation agent for Israel? I don't know. I won't pronounce on that, but why is he covering? Because it's pretty obvious that the uh, official narratives are inaccurate and flawed. So, but he has torn apart Israel yes. and military uh, moves they've made, and, and uh, yeah. in his you know, point of view, uh, apartheid Israel and everything else. He's gone after them so many times. I'm completely puzzled as to why he dismisses 9-11 as any kind of thing other than a, a bona fide terrorist attack. Well, I my understanding uh, is that the CIA intelligence agencies sometimes, okay, they'll, they'll give people like Noam a lot of leeway. He, he builds up a lot of credibility Correctly so. Well, he's not on the nightly news. They rarely interview him on Fox or some well, other well, CNN. But he has a lot of credibility with a lot of people. And if someone like that says, forget that conspiracy theory, boom. Well, That's very powerful. I'm holding out hope. That I'm holding out hopes for Noam that he does eventually one day, hopefully not a deathbed confession, but <laughs> at some point. Um, shine well, the light he's not back. the only one. Who else? And then, and then, uh, I, I don't know. It's all speculate. I don't know why that is. I mean, and then, of course, if you read Doug Valentine, he, he's basically an expert on the CIA. And if you, well, I'm sure you're aware of this, that, uh, well, just based on what we were talking about, what the CIA is doing with the terrorists orchestrating this, uh, that's basically, uh, I mean, Doug Valentine coined the phrase, the uh, organized crime branch of the United States government. Uh, I don't know. Like, are they threatening him? I, if they are, it might be a credible threat. But, I mean, I'm just guessing. Or is he, like Professor Tony Hall, is he a disinformation agency for the Mossad, the CIA? Let's face it. If Noam Chauncey, who, who has earned credibility, a great deal of credibility, sure. with the... With a lot of us, if he says 9-11 is, believe it all, folks, it's there. Well, guess what? A lot of people are going to believe that. Yeah, uh, it is frustrating. It just, it can't be. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's dangerous. I mean, uh, it's creating so much death and destruction, these lies. 
they weren't lying when they said uh, everything changed after 9-11 because that was that was put across to the public as though, oh, you know, we're in an unsafe world now. But what it what it really meant to me in retrospect was we've got this thing done. We're going to be able to dictate policy based on our narrative of it, and you won't question it or uh, complain about the money going into it because you need your safety that only we as the state can provide. Bingo. It's been a very effective fairy tale. Yeah. Work like a charm. Yeah. Well, listen, you've been so generous with your time. It's been uh, great speaking with you, and and you have to promise me that you're going to contact me when you're back from Syria, and we'll get a a follow-up of what you did actually see when you were there and who you spoke with. That would be so fascinating. Thank you very much. It was uh, really enjoyable. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark. Take care. Travel safely. Be sure to subscribe to Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park on iTunes and to our YouTube channel. If you want to support the show and help create more episodes, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash conspiracy queries. We appreciate your feedback, so send us comments, complaints, or queries of your own to conspiracyqueries at gmail.com, or you can post them on our website at conspiracyqueries.com. Thanks for listening.